Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to the Kaiser Report. Wow, I can feel the fraud. It's giving me the creepy creeps all over because I'm in Connecticut, Stamford and Greenwich. This is the headquarters of the global financial weapons of mass destruction manufacturing business. And that's why we've come to find out what the frick is going on. Stacy Herbert, talk to me. This episode is going to be dedicated to the notion of deja fraud, because you must have felt that standing in front of UBS. Anywhere there's a banker wielding a derivative, there is deja fraud happening. Now, this concept of deja fraud was introduced by Ray McGovern, a former CIA analyst. And he just wrote a letter, an open letter to President Obama about the Syria uh, situation. And he, he, he referred to Obama's use of a government assessment being sold as an intelligence summary. And he said, this is deja fraud. It's like the Downing Street memo, where Tony Blair ignored the advice of Richard Dearlove, who was the head of MI6, and just presented a, a sexed up dossier, let's call it. Right, well, selective amnesia uh, is something that was reliable for years, <laughs> where the population could be counted on to forget anything that happened two years ago or three years ago. But thanks to alternative media and the internet, everything is online being referenced and being shouted about by screaming bloggers and podcasters. And of course, this show is a big contributing factor to how those who want to believe that the current situation is not just recooked uh, fraud, intelligence fraud, again, are finding it difficult. And this, th to me, this smells like the Richard Nixon era, which I go into detail with that at some point, but I, I get where you're going with, with this. So, well, we're five years into the financial collapse, five years since Lehman Brothers collapsed, and Lehman Brothers collapsed due to a deja fraud of Repo 105. Repo 105 was what caused Enron to collapse, and then a few years later, Lehman Brothers to collapse. Five years later, USA Today is asking, 2008 financial crisis, could it happen again? And they're also asking, well, they're also saying, we should be worried. Why, Max? Because repackaging of debt is back. Right, this uh, repo 105 you talked about, going back to Lehman Brothers and the other scandals of the past five years, 10 years, it goes back to understanding that banks, essentially, when they say they've got something on their books, they don't really have anything on their books. In fact, they've loaned out that thing that they say they have out in their books to another bank that has, in fact, lent it out to some other bank. And it goes around in this daisy chain of fraud, or deja fraud, or a circle of fraud. And the problem with the 2008-2009 crisis is that there was no reform. There was no bank reform. Nobody went to jail, as people understand. And so you have not only the situation getting worse, as our guests in the second half will talk about, I'm sure, but uh, you've got the potential for a much worse situation developing because of the leverage that's in continuing to build you know, under like a volcano in the system. Yes, I'm gonna get back to that repackaging of debt that's going to cause some more deja fraud, presumably quite soon in the future. Now, I also wanna look at this headline from the UK, which is Alistair Darling interview. Britain was two hours away from total social collapse. Former chancellor on the crisis that erupted five years ago this week said. So here's the chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, Alistair Darling. And again, this is just like these going back to the Tony Blair era where we were 45 minutes away from Saddam Hussein nuking us and wiping us away. And here we have what reminder of Alistair Darling saying we were two hours away from societal collapse. Over in the U.S., we had Hank Paulson, former Goldman Sachs CEO, saying that uh, there would be revolution on the streets if you guys didn't pass TARP. So deja fraud. What's sad about the Alistair Darling quote that the world was two hours away from massive meltdown. That what's sad about that quote is what really we should understand is that we were two hours away from having some accountability in the banking sector. Exactly, exactly. We were two hours away from having honest accounting. Yeah. We were two hours away from getting rid of the bad actors and the massive fraud in Wall Street in the city of London. We were only two hours away from having an economy get rid of all these crooks and then regenerate itself, which would have started, we would be right now in an honest recovery with real jobs and real GDP growth instead of this hyper levered chimera of an economy that's set to blow once again. Exactly, because we are stuck on a loop, which is why 
we keep on having deja fraud. We're stuck in the loop. It keeps on happening over and over. And had we had the societal collapse that he threatened, it would have ended that loop and we could have started something new. Now, I know you were also in front of RBS down in Stanford. You saw that. And he said that was the scariest moment was when the chairman of RBS called him and said, all the money is leaving the bank. The system is collapsing. What are you going to do about it? And Alistair Darling said, that was the scariest moment. He wanted me to do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, once again, RBS, just one of the uh, four horsemen of the British financial apocalypse uh, that has uh, been allowed to metastasize and grow even bigger in threat to the British economy. And I noticed that what's happening in Britain and in the U.S. and around the world, what we predicted on this show is that interest rates on that 10-year note are creeping higher. Now above 3 percent or just around 3 percent, both sides of the Atlantic. The pundits that are spinning this positively say it's because of positive growth. And yet the only thing positive are the number of people on food stamps. Mm. So that's obviously a lie. It's deja fraud all over again, <laughs> as Yogi Berra might say. Uh, but what is happening is that the cost of servicing this fraud is going higher. For 25, 30 years, the cost of servicing fraud was going cheaper. Yeah. Yes, That's yes. what kept it going, is that the cost of fraud was cheaper, ever cheaper. That's kept the bubble expanding. But now the cost of fraud is going up. So now we'll see, as Warren Buffett said, when the tide goes out, who's not wearing a bathing suit. Now, I want to move to another thing that goes with this deja fraud, and that is nonsense jobs. In fact, David Graeber, who we've had on the show, he's the author of 5,000 Years of Debt. Well, uh, he used a little bit of a stronger word. I'll just say it's often sort into BS jobs. So. The modern phenomenon of nonsense jobs. In 1930, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by century's end, technology would have advanced sufficiently that countries like Britain or the United States would have achieved a 15-hour working week. And he notes that, in fact, we have essentially achieved that, but we keep on filling it up with nonsense jobs. So people are still working 50, 60, 70 hours a week in nonsense jobs, whether it's dog walking or serving hamburgers or things that look like hamburgers at various fast food outlets around the U.S. So we keep on having these nonsense jobs. What is that about? So he reckons it's partly like the Soviet Union, where everybody was guaranteed a job in order to prevent any revolution or uprising. And the same thing here is that they, they keep people in these nonsense jobs just to keep them occupied and feel like they're doing something. Otherwise, you might have revolution. But you, just like the Soviet Union, you would find three, four, five, six people serving you a hamburger and because they all needed a job. We have the same thing here. You have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand bankers delivering you the same asset, pretend this is a mortgage. Well, they rip it up, rip it up, rip it up, and disperse it to tens of thousands of bankers to sell and package and resell. Oh, you mean they take a mortgage like this and they say, oh, here's a mortgage we're going to sell to Bank B from Bank A, and then Bank B simply <laughs> repackages it as another set of mortgages. Now, these are four mortgages collateralized by the same single mortgage that they had from Bank A, and then they sell it to Bank C. Oh, now there's 16 mortgages we're going to sell it to Bank C that we got from Bank B, the leverage of Bank A, and this goes on in the deja fraud circle of fraud and creating a snow globe of fraud, creating the illusion of growth. But what you have is just more fraud. And I think what Keynes failed to foresee is number one, the rise of the parasite banking class. Mm. And number two, all the productivity gains that would have been there due to mechanization and industrialization have effectively been stolen by the parasite banking class. So by failing to see the rise of the what I call the Jamie Dimon tapeworm syndrome mm. is why he got it so wrong. And David Graeber also looks at the rise of resentment that goes along with this. So the actual people who are the working class have this sort of resentment through propaganda. But he compares it to, say, the case of, say, they, uh, we hired these expert, excellent cabinet makers. But instead, they show up at the job and they discover that they have to spend the whole time frying fish. So everybody in this cabinet making factory is actually frying fish all day. And by the end of the week, every week, you have fish piling up all over the workshop. So it stinks like to high heaven. Well, I think you could see that, too, in the banking industry. Because remember, UBS and Deutsche Bank are two of the biggest banks that you know, take all the highest trained engineers out of French universities, British universities, German universities. They hire all these engineers and then they go and rip up the same piece of paper over and over, faster, faster, to create more deja mortgages, more deja fraud. Yeah, everyone is specializing in jobs that they're no good at. Yes. Effectively. Yeah. So you take a, somebody who was uh, perhaps a specialist in one area, but because the economy is not rewarding uh, 
excellence in these areas per some kind of meritocratic system that you'd expect in a free market capitalist society, because you have money printing and you have central planning and you have America's version of the Politburo, you end up with people not doing what they can actually do well, mm -hmm. being shuffled around in this economy, doing stuff that they don't know how to do at all. And he goes on to say in that article that the people who end up doing the jobs like fish frying, with no matter if they're cabinet makers, is that they begin to resent the cabinet makers. Yes. And this is what's happening in America, is that people are beginning to resent everyone else in this economy because everyone's doing something that they don't really want to do. So that resentment quotient is rising. And when that becomes what the economists might call a breakdown in social cohesion, i.e. civil unrest, well, you know, the countdown has begun. Now that's a good point to segue to deja porn. <laughs> Now you're talking. Wow. <laughs> and it goes with these nonsense jobs. These are actually the real, real jobs, I think, in the porn industry, sizing up porn's power to crush the American workforce. So you know we had a dismal jobs report come out, and the participation rate is now at 35-year lows, not since 1978, and we had so few Americans working here. But the unemployment rate fell from 7.4% to 7.3%. The reason? 300,000 people dropped out of the labor force. So. They, but buried in Friday morning's rather dismal jobs report was a particularly strange bit of government data. The motion picture and sound recording industry shed more than 22,000 jobs in August, a 6% drop over July's number, and the biggest workforce decline of any sector last month. And they reckon it could be the porn industry. <laughs> well, it brings up an interesting point in economics was prices are really discovered on the margins. So here you have uh, the mainstream economic model suggesting that all is good to some degree, if you will, but on the margins you see a collapse in a niche market, but that becomes the definition of what's happening in the market overall. And so now you understand that by looking at the porn industry, you can extrapolate and understand that the core working environment in the U.S is collapsing as well. That's why the Japanese are developing porn bots. <laughs> so porn bots, Japanese porn bots, and some of them are mighty attractive, I might add, are engaged in Japanese porn bot sex. And this is going to be becoming a major industry in Japan, and I would imagine a major industry of their export business, which hopefully will take the place of all that energy they're losing now that TEPCO is uh, nuclear reacting into the Pacific Ocean and has uh, diminished in value to that country's economy. All right, Stacey Herbert, that's going to do it. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half. I'll be speaking with Jim Rickards. All right, I'm back. Kaiser Report with you. Max Kaiser reporting from the sanctuary in this Connecticut enclave of hedge funds in Greenwich and Stanford. But this is a hedge-free zone. I'm in the backyard of author Jim Rickards. Jim, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Welcome to Connecticut. Uh, we're loving it out here. And of course, you're working on a new book. And uh, you show me the galleys. It's yep. very exciting. Uh, can't wait for that to come out. But I wanted to cover some of the uh, recent stories in the news. Sure. You've recently come back from safari in Africa. Mm -hmm. Which which is more dangerous, Jim? The the African rhinos you encountered in the bush or the bankster sharks you encounter here on Metro North Train? Well, banksters are definitely a lot more dangerous than rhinos because rhino, uh, first of all, you know, rhino are very well behaved, but you know they can only charge one person at a time, whereas bankers can take out entire countries and entire populations. So because of leverage, I'd, I'd be a lot more worried about the bankers than the rhinos. While in transit back from Africa, you tweeted, hashtag, Fed relationship to BRICS is like a drunk driver who runs down pedestrians and then blames the pedestrians for being in the way. Right. Well, you know, I, as you say, I was on safari, but the reason I was in South Africa in the first place was to attend an investment conference hosted by the uh, one of the largest insurance companies in South Africa. So I had the opportunity to meet really the top institutional investors in the entire country. Um, so, you know, some of the wealthiest individuals, government officials, got a very good perspective. You know, we talk about BRICS and emerging markets like they're, you know, on the dark side of the moon. But when you're actually going to visit them and meet with their government officials and their policymakers, you really uh, understand how heartfelt their feeling is about what the Fed is doing to the entire world. Now, the Fed officials, uh, um, Reserve Bank governors, members of the, Fed, of the uh, Board of Governors, have said, well, look, we kind of know what's going on in emerging markets, but we don't care. Because our job is to take care of the United States economy, and you guys are on your own. 
Well, that's fine, but the, but the problem is when you're manipulating every market in the world, I don't think you can be quite so cavalier about what's going on in the rest of the world. And this is why I say they're like a you know, drunk driver running people off the road. They're having an enormous impact on these emerging markets. These, a lot of these emerging markets, capital markets, are just not that big relative to the U.S. and even, even Europe by comparison. So when you, you know, when you call interest rates at zero, everybody wants to do the carry trades, to so borrow dollars, um, you know, uh, then buy the local currency, invest in foreign assets, et cetera, make a spread, leverage it up, make a lot of money. Well, as soon as the Fed hints they're going to raise interest rates, you know, so-called tapering, everyone unwinds the carry trade. So they're just massively dumping assets in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, and elsewhere, dumping the currencies. South Africa has seen their currency go from, you know, eight to the dollar to almost eleven to the dollar in a matter of weeks. Uh, this is, you know, incredibly disruptive and damaging to them. And the Fed just says, "Well, it's your problem. You know, you've got central banks setting your own policy." Oh, so South Africa is supposed to raise interest rates when unemployment is sky high? I mean, it, the problem is there's no anchor in the financial system right now. For, 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 for you know, from 1870 to 2000, uh, sorry, to uh, to um, uh, 2010, we either had a gold standard. Or from 1980 to 2010, we had a dollar standard. You know, not as good as a gold standard, but at least it was a standard. Since 2010, we've had no standard. So everyone's adrift, and I, I don't think the central, I don't think the Fed can be quite so dismissive of, the, of these markets, or else they'll have a replay. Well, let me jump in here for sure. a second because you're saying you had a gold standard from 1870 or so going forward to 2010. Uh, and then there's no standard uh, with the interregnum or the period of the dollar standard. But wait, let's go back to, yeah. for a second because starting in the early 70s, you had an you had an oil petrodollar. Sure. And isn't that right now part of this unwinding in the macro sense? And we should point out that you're a macro analyst. You've got the yep. book Currency War, which yep. is a macro look at things that are going on. Your background, you you, you helped unwind long-term capital management here right. in Connecticut. You're very keen on this these macro issues, but. Today, with what's happening politically in America, some are positing that it's a breakdown of that petrodollar because it ties in Saudi Arabia, seems to be matched up against uh, Putin over Syria for rights to build a new pipeline from Saudi Arabia to Europe to compete with Putin's pipeline from Russia to Europe, which is, okay, I don't want to go on a huge yeah. uh, no, uh, tangent right. politically, but what, what happened to the petrodollar is my question. Well, of course, the, of course, the gold standard was abandoned in 1971. In the late 70s, kind of from 71 through 79, it really had a period of chaos. You know, people, they didn't know should we have fixed rates, floating rates, go back to gold, abandon gold, et cetera. And, you know, the U.S. was actively disparaging gold, dumping gold at the time, uh, and assisting on a dollar standard. So the Arabs were very worried. So, the, you know, Kissinger cut this deal. You're right. Said, look, you guys agreed to sell us oil for dollars, and we'll maintain the value of the dollar. That was backed up by Volcker and Reagan and carried all the way through Republican and Democratic administrations, not just by, you know, Volcker and Reagan, but also by Bush, James Baker, uh, Bob Rubin, Bill Clinton. And Volcker backed that up by raising interest rates. Well, he said, yeah, we're going to make the dollar valuable again. We're going to make, we're going to, it was the king dollar period, the, the sound dollar period. So, okay, not a gold standard, but a dollar standard. And that actually worked fairly well from 1980 to 2010. The problem is in 2010, Obama, Geithner, and Bernanke tore up the, the, the dollar standard, said, we're going to cheapen the dollar. We want to import inflation. Uh, you know, we're going to cut interest rates. You guys are on your own. So now there is no standard at all. So you have a new period of chaos. But if you're the Arabs, you know, the deal has been torn up. They said, you know, we're not going to maintain the value of the dollar. So the Arabs are like, well, okay, what do we get for our oil? Just paper money that you say you're trying to cheapen. So now they're like, they're, they're exploring a lot of alternatives. The GCC may have a common currency. Europe is creating a ruble zone. There's okay, a, the GCC being the cooperation, Gulf cooperation in Council, the, the Arab, major, Arab uh, world. The Persian Gulf, that's right. exactly right. Um, you're seeing the emergence of regional reserve currencies. You know, Korea, Japan, and China, despite all the tensions around the islands and all that, the fact is their trilateral trade is exploding and they're starting to accept each other's currency. So, and then of course you have the BRICS, and, you know, led by Putin uh, most recently, and they're going their own way. So what you're seeing is this slow diminution in the role of the dollar. It's not overnight, it's not immediate, but if it, you know, it's kind of like U.S. foreign policy. If the U.S. doesn't care, you know, if the U.S. isn't in charge, nobody's in charge. We see that playing out in Syria. Same thing with the dollar. If the dollar is not the global reserve currency, then it's jump ball, and you don't know what you're going to get. Return to a gold standard is a possibility, but I don't see that in the immediate future. I think we have to have a collapse first, a collapse of the dollar standard and the petrodollar deal. Then it'll have to be replaced with something. Now, that'll either be the SDR, which is the IMF world money, 
a special drawing right, or gold, or some combination of the two. That remains to be seen, but the dollar standard is definitely collapsing. It's been abandoned by the United States. It's not that we're under attack, we're abandoning it ourselves. Okay, so the 2008-2009 collapse period, we're about five years going into that, mm -hmm. post that period, and we've been saying on the show that, and really looking at a lot of your work is uh, a lot of the conditions that led up to the collapse are still there but have gotten much worse because the leverage has gotten a lot worse. Right. So now we're set up for another collapse and coming out of that collapse you're saying there will be some other reserve currency status could, could be the special drawing right the SDR or looking at gold again or some combination of the two. So the question is is this collapse a baked into the cake in other words it's it's going to happen with a high degree of certainty mm -hmm. and b will it be in fact a, a magnitude larger than what we saw in 2008 yes both of those things are correct the, the collapse is definitely coming because there have been no structural reforms no changes so in 2008 we heard about too big to fail well guess what the five biggest banks in 2008 are bigger today they have a higher concentration of um, all bank assets the derivatives books are larger the leverage is larger we have new bubbles coming up in student loans you know, we don't have subprime mortgages anymore but take a look at the student loan market over a trillion dollars that's a, another accident waiting to happen so all the conditions are there but here's the difference Max when this happens not only will it be bigger it'll be bigger than the Fed the last time the Fed bailed it out now look the Fed has taken their balance sheet from 800 billion to over 3.2 trillion in the last four years we haven't had a crisis since 2009 there's no shortage of liquidity yet they've taken their balance sheet to over 3 trillion without a liquidity crisis what are you going to do if we have a liquidity crisis which I expect they can't take it to six trillion or nine trillion they're at the limit they, the, the Fed is technically insolvent on a mark-to-market -market basis they don't have that capacity so the only clean balance sheet left in the world is the IMF so when this crisis happens the only way you're going to be able to reliquify the world is by printing SDRs. Wait a minute. He said there was no liquidity crisis going back five years. There, there was a liquidity crisis, yes. but they met the liquidity Correct. crisis by expanding their balance sheet. And what Correct. you're saying is that unlike that period, this next wave will overwhelm any capacity for the Fed to expand to what would need to be 30 trillion Correct. potentially right. in bad debt. So it's like the Hurricane Sandy of crisis where the entire lower Manhattan was completely underwater right. and the lights went out and uh, am I correct? Yeah, so I separate QE1 from QE2 and QE3. QE1 was a legitimate role of a central bank. When there's a liquidity crisis, you're supposed to provide liquidity. Going back to uh, Badgett, you know, and his description of what a central bank does in the 19th century. The Fed didn't do it the right way, but they were, they were right to provide liquidity. But once QE1 was over, beginning with QE2, that was not about liquidity anymore. That was about propping up nominal GDP because velocity was imploding. That's really micromanaging the economy. That's not the Fed's job. So QE2 and QE3 were completely wasteful. We will look back and see it as the greatest failed experiment, you know, in history. Um, but the problem is they did it anyway. And so now with the balance sheet of 3.2 trillion, if you have a liquidity crisis what are they going to do as I say go to six trillion there is a limit actually I've spoken to uh, President Evans the Chicago Fed and President Lockhart of the Atlanta Fed they said that there is no theoretical limit to the Fed's balance sheet maybe legally but I think that's wrong I think there's a political limit there's a practical limit and the and when you have a liquidity crisis you know the Bank of England is no better Bank of Japan is no better you look around the world People's Bank of China has uh, printed more money than the Fed and so the only place you're going to get new money printing is from the IMF All right let's talk about that limit for a second because the place where that might show up is in the bond market sure so the 10-year bond market which is the linchpin of the global mm -hmm global banking system, global economy, all credit reversed to the 10-year bond market. It, about six months ago or so, seemingly hit uh, a low on yields. Mm -hmm. on the, so in other words, a high on the bonds themselves. In the United States, it was at a 240-year high. and In England, it was at a 300-year high. Mm -hmm. So some are saying that the rise in yields telegraphs economic growth. But that seems odd, given that there's a huge people on food stamps and hourly wages are down and the job picture is a bunch of part-time jobs. It doesn't seem like growth to me. So is that rising bond yield A, is it telegraphing what you're saying, that there's nowhere to hide and they're heading toward another crisis? And B, is it a secular move? In other words, is this like a uh, going to be a 10 to 15 year bear market as you do see these larger cycles right. in markets? Well, it's a very good question, Max, but you have to remember the Fed is manipulating everything. So it's hard to look at history and know exactly how it's going to play out. The thing is, there is such a thing as, as a bull steepener, like an expanding economy with expanding credit, you know, more demand for loans. Interest rates should go up. That's a normal cyclical expansion. That's not what we're seeing. This is much more of, of a bear steepener. Uh, it's because, uh, frankly, China and Japan are buying fewer U.S. government securities. 
securities and the Fed may taper and that will tend to increase interest rates. Now, I spent a lot of time saying what the Fed wants, but just because you want something doesn't mean you get it. This is part of the Fed's impotence and the impotence of policy. What the Fed wants is either extremely low real rates or even negative real rates. They want a situation where inflation is higher than the 10-year the note. So just put the 10-year note at, say, 3%. you got to get to 4% inflation or 3.5% inflation to have negative real rates. What's been happening is the opposite. Nominal rates are going up. Inflation is going down. So real rates are getting um, uh, higher. And this kills the economy. So, I mean, we'll see what happens with the Fed tapering. My view all along is that they won't taper. But it's a really close call. But, but let me jump yeah, in. Sure. We only have about 30 seconds left. Yeah. Isn't there a huge problem, I guess you could call it the transfer mechanism, between what's happening in the central bank level and that money getting into the real economy? Because it's being aborted by the banks that get in the middle who are using it to lend back to the Fed or to speculate or to buy assets. And again, this predatory banking class is becoming highly disruptive, right? Sure. I mean, this is a part of financial repression. Let's say you're a banker, okay? So you borrow at 25 basis points, you invest at uh, 3%, you make 275 uh, uh, basis point yield, you leverage it 10 to 1, you got 27% returns on equity. It's free money. Why wouldn't you do that? It gives, it gives the Treasury a captive buyer. The banks are captive buyers of the Treasury. Okay, we've got only 10 seconds left. We didn't get to gold exactly, but I take it you're still bullish on gold. Absolutely. Long term, I've got it. Yeah, $7,000 now is probably higher. All right, fair enough. Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank our guest, author Jim Rickards. If you want to tweet us, do so at Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.